In the 7th century, Mohammedan Arabs took Palestine. What is important about Palestine to you? Rock of the Dome. That's where all the Bible happened, wasn't it? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Most of it. Well, Italy, some of it. but uh, And points in between. But that's where Jesus lived. That's where the Garden, well, the Garden of Eden was to the east of that in uh, Babylon, probably. Mm -hmm. But uh, very important, called by some holy land. I do not believe the ground there is holy. I believe it is a very special Bible land because it's special as far as history. It would be like Steve and me are, we are. Uh, Restoration history buffs, and we would like to go to Cane Ridge or someplace like that, Upper Spencer or whatever. Uh, it's like that. But in the 12th and 13th century, there were mass migrations of people from Western Europe into the Near East for the purpose of recovering the Holy Lands from the Muslims, from the Turks, who were Seljuk, Seljuk Turks who were uh, Muslims. They came in 1073. Uh, the Mohammedans uh, took over in the uh, 7th century, and then the Turks took it away from them. They were all still Muslim. Uh, it became difficult for Christians to visit so for the so-called Holy Land. Why, when did Christians start visiting the land? You remember last week we told you who got that started? Those tours of the Holy Land? Constantine's mother, uh, Helena, she... I uh, wanted to, to uh, start a uh, pilgrimage there to go back and see where Jesus was and all that. Well, that became difficult <coughs> and dangerous after the Muslims took it over. And so the military effort to take the Holy Land so-called back from the Muslims uh, is what is commonly called the Crusades. And uh, there were several of them. They went on for many years. Many different kings would send, uh, and popes. The popes were behind sending uh, people there. And there would be bloody battles. And uh, there was one, um, <coughs> the uh, people from Rome and the people from the Christians that were trying to take it back were they weren't very well prepared. They were farmers and, and herdsmen and they didn't really have good weaponry and the Muslims were professional soldiers. And uh, of course they didn't have a chance but they were about to give up and you talk about latter day revelation and false documents and all that. Somebody they were just about to give up and somebody found the spear the actual spear that had pierced Jesus' side. They found it in Jerusalem. And uh, so that, they used that as a rally, uh, by a battle cry to rally the troops, and they went back and tried one more time. And of course, it was a bloody, unsuccessful thing. The Muslims still control a great part of that area. As you know, in 1948, the United Nations gave part of it back to Israel, and uh, it's been a headache ever since. <laughs> Uh, they, they never have really uh, settled on that. And so uh, there have been many bloody battles unnecessarily. We don't have to have the so-called Holy Land to worship God, do we? We can do it any place. Yeah. So the papacy has taken over. They are the powerful ones. They are ruling the world with an iron fist. The world is ignorant. They, uh, most of them can't, are illiterate, most of them uneducated, and so the educated man in the monastery or in the uh, papacy can tell them what God wants them to know. That is a very dangerous thing. <laughs> Anytime some guy, I've had them, I had them come here before and uh, say, uh, you know, God spoke to me. I was sitting on the front porch in uh, uh, Sarahsville one time. Salyersville. It's Sarahsville up there. Uh, Salyersville on my front porch when I was preaching there. And a big Buick comes sliding into my driveway and a guy jumped out and said, the Lord told me you had $20 in your pocket for me. And I said, well, it must have been Satan because he lied to me. <laughs> because I don't have $20 in my pocket and it wouldn't be for you if I did. And uh, so, but there, man, what if you could convince people of that? Uh, the, the Lord told me, you know, 
for this church needs to get me a new car, you know, mm -hmm. or something. And there are, there are people who do that, who try to convince people that God speaks directly to them. Uh, let me encourage you to study the Bible and the Bible alone because that is the complete revelation. The complete revelation of God. There's not going to be any new revelation. Uh, and somebody comes along and tells you he just heard from God and uh, a, a man came walking in. <laughs> I've had a lot of these experiences. Man, I'm standing up preaching one time, Jason, and a man came walking into the auditorium and said, God told me to preach this morning. And I said, well, you're not going to. <laughs> you know, and, and I'll take my chances, uh, but you're not going to. And I had a man at a funeral one time. I was preaching to his brother, speaking to his brother's funeral, and he walked up and said, the Lord just gave me a message, and I'm going to deliver it at his brother's funeral. He, was, he had this big cup in his hand. I'm really naive and ignorant about a lot of stuff. He had this big, great, big cup in his hand. And it, with every drink, he got a little louder and a little bolder. <laughs> and so he finally decided to preach his brother. You know. Latter-day Revelation. Um, opposition. Finally, they got, some people had enough. One of the earliest ones in 160, we're going back now to right after the apostles. 160 to 235 was Hippolytus or Hippolytus. He... Uh, started a congregation in Rome which opposed uh, three men that were later called popes. Uh, interesting thing about him, though, uh, later on, the Roman Catholic Church made him a saint. And uh, after he died, they, uh, they made him a saint. Later was Tertullian in the late 2nd and early 3rd century. And uh, he was a prolific writer among Christian apologists. We talked about him Earlier, when we talked about the writers, uh, Eusebius and others, he lived in the latter part of the second century, the early third, and he was a strong opponent of the growing hierarchy. And uh, these are just two of the outstanding men who opposed uh, the Roman uh, papacy. A lot of others would say, wait a minute, that's not the way the church is set up in the Bible. And uh, sometimes they would meet untimely deaths. The uh, bishop of Constantinople um, was uh, in opposition to the Roman bishop and uh, he uh, came into prominence and became the leader of the church uh, in that part of the empire and so there was a rivalry between the two of them and they were oftentimes uh, at odds. The bishop at Rome in the western church and so you have these two at each other's throat. The Council of Chalcedon in 451 decreed that the Bishop of Constantinople was equal to the Bishop of Rome, and that was confirmed again in 692 at another council. Now, what's the problem with these councils? They're headed by men. Yeah, they're controlled by men, but they're considered to be binding legislation or binding uh, revelation. What comes out of that council is the rule uh, for, uh, for this particular group. Uh, and so they are, uh, people start to oppose that. People get enough of it. The apostles wouldn't have put up with it. Uh, every, you, Paul uh, condemned a lot of folks who were doing things out of order. The seven letters to the churches in Asia in Revelation, only one of them was told, keep doing what you're doing. The rest of them said, you need to straighten up uh, the other six. And uh, there are places uh, where John wrote uh, to the church and Paul. Uh, Paul's whole Corinthian letter is, you guys have gotten this wrong, uh, you, and you need to get it right. And so the Montanists in the second century uh, was another group that uh, uh, opposed these things. They rejected the authority of the Roman bishop. Uh, they... Uh, uh, did not uh, bow to his authority. The Novatians in the third and fourth century, the Donatists, you can see what all of these people believe uh, in the, uh, as we go along, we'll get into more of it, but uh, the Waldensians, the Petrobrusians, uh, 13th and 14th century, the Waldensians, uh, and uh, all the way up to the Reformation. Uh, there is evidence by Dr. Hans Grimm that the true Church of Christ did exist during uh, this time. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few of these groups. The Carthists, 
Cartharist. Arnold of uh, Brescia was the uh, head of that group. And they were in the ninth century. And they found, were found especially in Greece, Italy, Germany, France, and Holland. They were known, excuse me, by local names, uh, Catharist and Paulicans. And uh, no, Arnold of Brescia wasn't that. This is, the Catharist was a different group. Uh, the Catharist is kind of the general uh, category covering all of these opposition leaders. Uh, but uh, they were a group of people who uh, opposed them. Arnold of Brescia was one of them. And here's what the Catholic Church did to them. Here's what I want you to know about them. Uh, Arnold was hanged in 1155, his body burned and his ashes thrown into the Tiber River. Peter of Bruce was another one and uh, he was executed in 1130. Peter Waldo of the Waldensians was branded with a hot iron on his forehead and after severe punishment died and gave his life for the faith and all of his followers. Uh, the Albigenses in the 1200s in uh, southern France Let's read about them on page 213 in your textbook. Hmm? 225 in this edition. Oh, okay, sorry. 213 in mine. Uh, well, here's your line of succession. Every one of these groups yeah. had small congregations in the Lord's Church. They did. That's they why did. they're... Yeah, and and every one of them uh, helped the one that came after it. It got a little better all the time. Um, a strong crusade emerged against the Albert Albigenses in order to stir up hatred. Special rewards as well as indulgences were promised by the Pope to everyone who would leave his occupation for 40 days and joined the war against the Albigenses. Uh, over 50,000 soldiers were mounted and equipped for battle, and the Albigenses were unarmed, unprepared, and so the papal force with fire and sword easily ravaged their entire communities. Uh, took the whole city of Bazir. Uh, it was a stronghold, and when you get down to, uh, down about the middle of the page, it says a chronicler, chronicler for the occasion said, Hundreds of villages had seen all their inhabitants massacred with a blind fury with the crusaders giving themselves to trouble, uh, the trouble to examine uh, whether they contained a single heretic without them giving themselves to that. Uh, they didn't care if there were heretics in there or not. They just were wiping it out. Uh, the harvest of the country people and the provisions and merchandise of the citizens were divided at discretion among the marauding assailants. That's horrible. You get that? There was scarcely a peasant who did not reckon in his family some unhappy one whose life had been cut off by the sword of Montford soldiers and whose property had not been repeatedly ravaged more than three quarters of the knights and lorded proprietors of the district had been despoiled of their castles and fiefs. They, they took their property, their houses and all. But look at this. Conservative estimates state that two-thirds of the people of southern France were killed in this effort to wipe out the heresy of Albigensianism. Uh, the Catholic Church, <laughs> the Roman Church, killed two-thirds of the people in southern France uh, to stop these, uh, what they call, heresies. Then there were the Inquisitions. Um, an Inquisition, what does that sound like to you? A trial? Um, where someone would be questioned and uh, try to uh, uh, get them to admit something. Uh, the heretics were to be tried and ex executed. They came to France in 1233, to Italy in 1254. It became an organization of terror. And look at this. The effort of the Inquisitor was to force the admission of guilt. And of course, you've heard of the Spanish Inquisitions, mm -hmm. the most terrifying ones where thousands were killed. And all of this by the church uh, in order to try to keep the power that they had been given. And so these are, and, and please read all that in your textbook. Uh, 
it's just a horrible part of their history. So, we've gotten to a horrible place in the church. People are being killed if they don't go along with the Pope. The Pope has all power. He can uh, control all of these things and, uh, and is doing so. And so we uh, come to the need for reformation. Tell me the difference between re a reformer and a restorer. A reformer just makes it, changes it, but a re restorer goes back to the original. Yeah, I've owned several old cars over the years, and uh, I have never restored one. I have repaired and fixed up and sold to people who wanted to restore. Uh, restoration, there are some guys out there who restore cars, and if one bolt is different than the original, it's not a restoration, mm -hmm. it's a repair job. I just make them look good and sell them. <laughs> but uh, um, there are guys who are really big on restoration. Restoration is putting it back like it was in the beginning. Reform is fix, trying to fix what's wrong with it. So when it comes to church, a reformer was trying to fix what was wrong with the Catholic Church, as opposed to scrapping the whole thing and starting over again. And uh, when you try to fix what's wrong with the church, that is so big and so powerful and is operated by people who don't want to be fixed. Mm -hmm. It is a fruitless effort. And, and, and it, it helped lead to restoration in the last two classes, class seven and eight, Lord willing, we're going to talk about restoration. Uh, but uh, we're just in class four right now. So some of the problems that had arisen, celibacy was one of them. Uh, Paul talks about being married, and uh, in 1 uh, uh, Timothy 4 and verse 3, uh, he talks about, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, there, there are some, that, some who read 1 Corinthians 7, and, and you're all Bible people, so you know what I'm talking about. There are some who uh, believe that 1 Corinthians 7 teaches that sing, being single and celibate is a more holy state than marriage. It doesn't teach that. Paul tells the Corinthian Christians, for the present time, it may be better or it would be better if you didn't marry. But remember why he said that. Because of the present distress. There was some sort of persecution going on. There was some sort of present distress. And if you were already single, it would not be wise to take on the responsibility of a mate at that time. He didn't say it was a more holy state because he was... Or, uh, yeah, Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, uh, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And so, uh, celibacy was one of the things. Gregory the Seventh, uh, well, it was enforced, and they forced the priests to be celibate. It was one of the points under consideration at the Nicene Council. We talked about those ecumenical councils last week, the, the Council of Nicaea in 325. That was one of the things. Uh, since Gregory, this unnatural prohibition has only produced immorality, and you could see how it would. Uh, celibacy was one of the problems, and uh, preachers who were married, uh, Luther was married, uh, Calvin was married, others were married, and, and they fell in uh, uh, disrepute and fell out with the church. Uh, there was another thing, Simon. You remember Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8? What did he try to do? Buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, he tried to buy the gifts, the yes. ability, the ability to pass the gifts on. He tried to purchase that with money. So when we say the Catholic Church or the Roman Church uh, was guilty of simony, what are we saying? They were buying offices. And uh, the Pope was making lots of money. Uh, one third of the wealth of Europe in terms of real estate lay in the hands of the church in these crucial years. Uh, in addition to revenue from its land, uh, they paid dues, the clergy paid dues for the uh, uh, right to hold offices. They paid to the papacy. The priests reimbursed themselves by charging exorbitant fees for their services. 
The priest would pay for his office, and then he, it was retail, man. It, it was business. He would jack the price up for doing weddings and funerals and, and uh, working with the local parish or whatever. And so it became a very lucrative business known as simony. And uh, the, uh, uh, it is said that, that some of the popes were making in the millions by selling these offices. Indulgences became the big one. And as we get to Martin Luther later, probably not this week, but later, as we get to Martin Luther, uh, we will learn more about indulgences. What is an indulgence? Well, let me read this. The Roman Catholic Church to this day claims that Jesus, Mary, and the saints did so many good works, they left behind merit, spiritual merit, that they didn't need. That treasury of merit is in the possession of the church. And the Roman Catholic Church uh, uh, owns it and it can be bestowed on others as the church wills. Now think about that. Uh, Jesus, Mary, and the apostles and others did so many good works that there's a bank somewhere. They didn't use them all up. There's a bank somewhere uh, with their good works in it. And since you and I are such a mess, we have to have some of those good works to go to heaven. And so how do we get that? Who's in control of it? The church is in control of it. Uh, so as according to them, to the, the uh, uh, Roman church, when God forgives, there are some sins for which he remits only the eternal punishment. There is still the temporal punishment that must be endured. And if it's not endured in this lifetime, then it must be endured in purgatory. Remember, we talked about purgatory. Through the giving of indulgences, the Roman Catholic Church can shorten that punishment, whether on earth or in purgatory. And so here's the picture. You uh, have sinned. God has forgiven it on that side. But on this side, you have to have forgiveness from the church. And it's going to cost you. And uh, also, there are some who didn't get that forgiveness before they died. They're hanging out there in purgatory, and you have to do something to get them out of that into heaven. That's the doctrine. I know what it sounds like, but that's it. Um, also, some an enterprising fellow, a commissioned salesman named John Tetzel, a commission salesman named John Tetzel got the idea that if you can make money selling indulgences for past sins, just think of the money you can make selling indulgences for future sins. And so they wanted to build St. And I'll show you a picture of it later. They wanted to uh, build St. Peter's Cathedral uh, in Rome. And they needed lots of money. So they hired commission salesmen like John Tetzel. And he was one of the more colorful ones. And so what he did was uh, he went out and sold indulgences for future sins. Now there's a funny story told about it. Uh, it may be false, but it says a leader of a gang of ruffians approached Tetzel to obtain pardon through the purchase of an indulgence. Will indulgences forgive future sins as well, he asked. Tetzel assured him that they would, and the young man paid him immediately. That night, the young man came back and robbed Tetzel and got his money back because he'd already been forgiven for it. Do they still do that, Catholics? They still practice indulgences. As mm -hmm. far as blatantly charging, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, they yeah. do? Oh, yeah. You, you just don't know how much. Yeah. You, you got to have a conference with the priest. Ah, you have and a, then, and you, well, you, yeah. you can buy your way out of a marriage. You can buy uh, anything that you want. Yeah. Well, I used to work with Catholics, and when somebody died, they would want you to contribute to this fund so they could buy. Get them out of purgatory? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they hadn't been forgiven of their earthly side of the sea. They just wanted to make sure that, yeah. that person didn't spend Yeah. Time. Well, John Tetzel had this clever little sales pitch. He would say, every time a coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory is free. <laughs> that, that, was what, what, that was what he used, and he raised millions. Uh, he fed on superstitious fears, keeping citizens in fear and ignorance. 
Wild ideas about demons and witches were thrown among the uh, illiterate, and, and a lot of those stories are still around today from old European uh, mm -hmm. stories. And the, the reason they did that, they were scaring people into giving money. And uh, that it was all about money. But on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the death warrant on indulgences to a cathedral door in Wittenberg. His 95 theses were arguments against everything about the sale of indulgences. And so Luther, the one big thing that drove him, and we'll talk more about him later on, but the one big thing that really drove him was uh, uh, the sale of indulgences. He, he just couldn't abide by that. That was just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And uh, we'll talk more about who he was and what he was and all that. Uh, one of the interesting things, I gave you a little paper there about the printing press invented by Gutenberg in, what is it, 1440? 1440, Gutenberg invented the printing press. One of the great things that Luther used for the Reformation was a printing press. It had been invented about 40 years before he was born, and so it had been perfected. They'd gotten the bugs out of it and everything. And Luther could print material and distribute it faster than the Catholic Church could discredit it with the printing press. And so he printed these 95 theses. He printed three tracts about indulgences. And uh, back in those days, they didn't have television, radio, and all that. The printed word was the way it spread. And it spread throughout Germany, and Luther was just the, the top of the heap uh, there. And so the Catholic Church could not completely shut him down because uh, uh, he was a powerful salesman in his own right and popular with the people and with the prince, and as soon his words were distributed all over Germany. And uh, John Tetzel's indulgence sales <laughs> came to an abrupt end with the wrath of the public aroused, this is uh, from a biography of him, uh, with the wrath of the public aroused against him, John Tetzel was forced to retire to the monastery at Leipzig, and it was at that time Karl von Melitz wrote up numerous accusations against him, further scandalizing his already damaged reputation. Uh, broken and in ill health, John Tetzel passed away in 1519. So one of the richest sources was indulgences. Another practice that the Reformationists could not stand and wanted to work against was hagiolatry, not the worship of old hags. <laughs> what do you think hagiolatry is? Well, worship of departed saints. Why? Hagios is the word for spirit, uh, for holy. And uh, so... Uh, hagiolatry, hagiolatry, what they would worship departed saints and they would, if they would uh, have, they, they would accredit a miracle to them and, and great things in their lifetime, then they would make them saints. One of the early reformers was William of Ockham. He uh, lived from 1300 to 1349, and uh, he began to build on uh, the Reformation ideas. Uh, he said the general council of the church was of higher authority than the Pope. Well, that really flies in the face of the Pope, doesn't it? Uh, he, he said the Bible was the only infallible source of authority. In secular matters, the church and the Pope uh, in secular matters, the church and the pope were subordinate to the state. Now, what did the pope say? He spent years, they spent hundreds of years taking the throne away from the uh, emperor. And so now, William comes along and says, no, that's not the way it ought to be. Uh, we ought to be in subject to the governing authorities. Why, where did he get that from? Romans yeah, <laughs> he got it from the Bible, Romans 13. And uh, other places. And so he was one of the early reformers. John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation. Born 1325 in Yorkshire, England. Studied at Oxford. Graduated in 1358. And again in 1372. Became a priest in the Catholic Church. And worked in two parishes. 
1377, Pope Gregory the 11th condemned Wycliffe's ideas. Uh, he had Reformation ideas about uh, going back. Uh, Boniface the 8th issued a papal bull, the Unum Sanctum, which declared that neither salvation nor remission of sins, listen to this, could be found outside the Roman church, and the Pope, as the head of the church, had spiritual and temporal authority over all, and that submission to the Pope was necessary for salvation. Now that's what they declared. Wycliffe, though, believed that people ought to be able to read the Bible for themselves, and the constitutions of Archbishop Arundel in 1408 outlawed the translation of the Bible into English, but Wycliffe wanted it translated. And uh, one of the most scoffed at ideas was translating the Bible into what they called a vulgar and rustic language as English. Why was it important to keep it in Latin and keep it out of the hands of the common man? People stupid. Nobody understood from English. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Luther translated the Bible into German. Yeah, 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 he, he did, he did we, that, we, but if yeah. you were English, you couldn't. When we get dirty. to him, we'll, when we get ready to get into him, we'll... Knowledge comes power. Yeah, yeah, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, is it hard for you to wrap your mind around that? Because in America, I think I've got probably 50 Bibles would be a conservative estimate, 50 copies uh, in my library and at my house and in my car. I've got one in every car. I've got one in every sports coat. Uh, I, I have a little... Uh, calendar version in every sports coat that I use at funerals and weddings. And, and yeah, I, I'm sure I have at least 50 copies, maybe more. Yeah, you too. Uh, imagine not having one copy, and the only copy in the village is chained to the pulpit at church. And you have to have an appointment to see it, and it's written in Latin, and you don't understand it, and the priest has to tell you what it says. Now, there are foreign countries like that now where people just scramble for the Bible. I have a lot of friends that after the Iron Curtain fell, they went to uh, those, uh, those countries uh, that had been part of USSR and distributed Bibles, and people will stand in the rain barefooted for hours to get their copy of the Bible, uh, their own copy. And so for us spoiled Americans, uh, that this may not ring as... as uh, May not hit home the way it does there. Translating the Bible into the language of the common people sent shockwaves through the church. Why? Because it leveled the playing field. It leveled the playing field. You tell me I have to do this? Well, let's see what the Bible says. You can read the Bible. Yeah, I got it for myself yesterday, a fellow yesterday. <laughs> and uh, every time we'd come to something, I'd say, read it out of your Bible. And he wasn't the greatest reader ever was, but it was an effective way to do it. Uh, he would read it out of his Bible, and he would say, so, so you're not just making this up. <laughs> no, no, there it is. You read it in your Bible. And I was very careful not to interpret. I just let him read it. And uh, uh, he's a fairly new Christian. He's already been baptized, but uh, he's got a long way to go. But having him read it out of his own Bible really helped. Uh, in his uh, De Ecclesia De Veritat Sacra Scripturae De Prostit Pape, that was a pamphlet written by Wycliffe. He argued that the Bible was the sole criteria of doctrine to which no ecclesiastical <coughs> authority might lawfully add, and that the authority of the Pope was ill founded in Scripture. Well, if you want to get in trouble with the Pope, mm -hmm. here you go. Uh, the idea of the Lord's Supper being a sacrament and the idea of transubstantiation were also on his hit list. And preaching against those ideas caused a stir in 1379 that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And in 1380, Oxford University condemned his teaching. You remember what the doctrine of transubstantiation is? That's where the priest does certain things that turns the Lord's Supper into the actual body and blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's called a sacrament and it can only be uh, administered by a priest. And so, but you have to have it. You have to have it to be in good standing with God. And so if you fall out with the priest and he refuses that sacrament, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, according to them. Well, Wycliffe came along and said, that's a bunch of hogwash. Uh, and boy, they didn't stand for that long. His followers became known as Wallards. 
and his ideas spread far and wide. For the followers of Wycliffe, the scriptures were the sole authority in religion, and every man had the right to read and interpret them for himself. Uh, Carnes, in his history of the Bible, or of Christianity, suggests that Wycliffe taught the church should model itself after the pattern of the New Testament. Well, who's that sound like? That sounds like us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what we try to do. And uh, Wycliffe's writings were destroyed. His ideas were condemned at the Council of Constance. They called a special council for him in 1415. Further motivated by what he had done to the Catholic Church's grip on power, his bones were dug up and burned and scattered over the River Swift in 1428. They hated him that badly. He had damaged the Catholic Church uh, to, to that degree. Wycliffe's fundamental contribution to Christian history is he thought the common people ought to be able to read the Bible in their own language since the Bible is the source of all truth. Now that was a big step from the ignorant, illiterate, dark ages to uh, coming along and saying, look, I'm going to translate it in, a, in, in the common language. And he did. Uh, I, I, I'm going to bring it to the common people. And boy, he was... Uh, he, <laughs> they hated him so badly that badly they dug his bones up and murdered him. But that's a, one of the reformers. It's finally starting to turn. The tide is. The next one is John Huss. We'll talk about him and maybe one more, and then we'll dismiss for the, the evening. Uh, Huss is uh, often associated with the end of the Middle Ages, the end of the Dark Period. Uh, born in 1369, his name means goose. I just thought that was funny. Uh, comes from the town where he was born, who's in that Bohemia. He studied at Char Charles University in Prague and became a priest in 1400. Now, the thing about all these guys is they're all Catholic priests. Mm -hmm. And uh, they get in the church and they start serving as a priest and they realize, wait a minute, we're not doing things right. And so they start trying to change. I've tried to change congregations before. I'm not nearly on the level these guys are. But uh, I've been in congregations, been asked to come to congregations and be the preacher where they had departed from the truth to pull them back to the center. Uh, that's been done successfully a few times, not always. Do you think maybe since they became priests, they had access to the Bible where yeah. they didn't have it before? And yeah, where... yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> that was the problem for the Catholic Church. They, these guys are educated, and they have access to the Bible, and they can read it and understand it for themselves, and they're saying, wait a minute, we haven't been doing this right for hundreds of years. We've gone way off the path. Um, did they come from money, or did they come up because usually money will try to preserve itself, and so they will cling to the old ways, but somebody new coming into the system and going to the university, learning the stuff, and then becoming a priest, you know, they didn't have anything to lean back on and try to preserve. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but there's probably something to that. The fact is, most of these guys lived as paupers, but they didn't starve because... Uh, when they fell out with the church, they usually had supporters. They, they usually had people who would say, uh, you know, I believe in your ideals and I'm not going to let you lose your place or I'm not going to let you die or <laughs> of starvation or whatever. But they had some pretty rough, they, uh, pretty rough lives, though, because of the church. Uh, he preached at Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. Charles University had been established by Charles IV in order to rival Oxford in England and the University of Paris in France. Hush was an enthusiastic supporter of John Wycliffe. You see how one generation builds on the next? Uh, each one of them helps a little bit. I often tell people that uh, we benefit from generations in the past. Uh, the fellow who invented the printing press was the forerunner of the fellow who invented the computer. You know, they, each generation built on, on the other. Uh, the fellow who invented electricity is uh, the forerunner of the fellow who, who invented all the things that we use electricity now, the various generations. Each one builds on the one before. And so Huss was, uh, he supported John Wycliffe. The Czech scholars at Charles loved him. Both popes wanted the university to condemn him. Both popes, the one in Constantinople and the one in uh, Rome, wanted him condemned. A council, they had another council, 
met at Pizza to resolve the issue of two popes. Uh, both popes, Benedict and Gregory, were kicked out and a new one chosen, Alexander V. So the Catholic Church for a while had three popes scattered around. A uh, crisis point came in 1411 when one of the popes called for a crusade, a, a war, against Naples because they were supporting one of the other popes. Huss was appalled and preached loudly and vociferously against an idea, this idea. He was excommunicated by Pope John the 23rd in 1411. Huss's ideas were spreading along with Wycliffe's though, the idea that all Christians were part of the church, not just the Howard. And so at the Council of Constance, all three popes were forced to resign and Martin V was appointed. Huss was tried for heresy on July 6, 1415 and condemned to be burned to death. And so you have Wycliffe, who dig up his bones and burn them and throw them in the river. You have Huss, uh, who is uh, to be burned to death. He would reject any doctrine or practice that was not found in the Bible. The Eucharist was his particular target. His second major criticism was the power of church authority. The more radical of his followers, uh, everybody has extreme groups, by the way, and he had an extreme group of followers called the Taborites that rejected all in faith and practice of the Roman church that could not be found in Scripture. Now, that doesn't sound radical to us, does it? But in that day and time, it was, because were there more than a few things found in the Roman church that could not be found in Scripture? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, lots of things. And so the, uh, they were called extremists. After 1415, he became a national hero, a martyr, if you will. His followers drew up a list of demands for the Catholic Church with four parts, four, called the Four Articles of Prague. Bread and wine would be served to the congregation. During the Eucharist, this doctrine had its own name, uh, Utraquism, and those who support the idea uh, Calyx scenes for calyx or cup. Penance would be meted out fairly. Preachers could preach without authorization of the bishop. Priests were to embrace total poverty. Now that's not a biblical thing, and so they, they still don't have it all, but they're headed in the right direction, aren't they? They're headed in the direction of reform. Uh, Sigismund, Holy Roman Emperor by the lost five crusades against Huss's followers. These are military operations against people because they disagree with the church. You think about that. Uh, because they have these Reformation ideas. Uh, from 1420 to the 1430s, the conservatives came to be called the Bohemian Brethren or the Moravians who would later join Luther and his movement in the 1500s. Uh, Girolamo Savonarola. I practiced that today, but it didn't roll off very well. He boldly attacked priests in his sermons. He was from 1452 to 1498. Became dictator of Florence, Italy in 1495. His big sin was he preached from the Bible. That was his big heresy. He preached from the Bible. He tried to re reorganize the Catholic Church on biblical principles. Good luck with that. Uh, he was condemned as a heretic, tortured for six days, and then hanged in his body burned in 1498. Zemenes, 1436 to 1517. These are all in your textbook, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, he tried to reform the church in Spain. A lot of them concentrated on just located areas or countries. Luther was in Germany. Zwingli was in Switzerland. Uh, Zemenes in Spain. He gave up a career in law to become a Franciscan monk. And in 1492, what, remember that day, you know, was made chief advisor to Queen Isabella in matters of both church and state. He drove out a thousand corrupt priests from Spain, taught the purpose of the church was to serve the master, masses rather than exploiting them. Exploiting them. And uh, he said the shepherd is to feed the flock, not share it. I like that. <laughs> the shepherd's supposed to be feeding the flock, not sharing it. Erasmus was a Dutch scholar, taught about the early departure of the church from biblical Teaching, he edited the first printed Greek New Testament, which pointed out glaring flaws in the Latin Vulgate that the Catholics used. Uh, some, someone said that Erasmus laid the egg that Luther later hatched. All these guys build on each other. And so we will begin talking about the Reformation in earnest. Uh,
next week.